Something's missing and here is still small voice You just keep dismissing Do you know how it feels To be troubled inside To think just for you When across someone died Do you know how it feels not to surrender and have your sin washed away Never to be remembered and know that it's real Ain't it good to know just how it feels How does it feel to know you're a child of the king Your heavenly father Owns everything And how does it feel To know you are loved By the one who created The stars up above And how does it feel To know you're when you lay your head on the pillow each night And know heaven's real Ain't it good to know just how it feels Do you know how it feels When your cold heart is melted and the tears started flowing and oh how you felt it do you know how it feels to know you've been changed and it feels like your whole world has been rearranged do you know how it feels wherever you roam you get the feeling that you're not at home And no, heaven's real Ain't it good to know Just how it feels How does it feel to know Your child of the king Heavenly Father Owns everything And how does it feel To know you are loved By the one who created The stars up above And how does it feel To know you're alright When you lay your head on Below each night I know heaven's real Ain't it good to know just how it feels Like um, Cosby said, you know, don't try to fool me. I'll find out who you are. <laughs> one of his one of his own kids. You know. Anyway, Jeff, that was good. Amen. All right. Good morning, folks. Good morning, good morning. Looks like some folks overslept this morning here, right in the front row. I'm not in the front row, but kind of looks like the Red Sea parted right here in front of me. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. And uh, we did have a good, um, I talked to Brother Mitchell, and he said he had a good crowd in the 845 service. And then uh, I think our Sunday school looked pretty good, and I'm glad you're here. Go to Matthew chapter 7, and I want to talk to you a little bit um, about, um, we're talking about um, the church and church members and church membership and 
and uh, how to glorify Christ in the church and things of that nature. During this month, this is uh, what we call Membership Month. And uh, if you haven't made Open Door Baptist Church your home church, I hope you'll do that uh, soon. Um, but anyway, this is a Baptist church, but uh, you know that really doesn't matter. We're not, uh, I guess I told you the story, every story I know I've been telling for 30 years, but, and, uh, well, anyway, uh, you know, in kindergarten they have show and tell, and uh, little kids are supposed to bring things and talk about them, and so uh, there was an assignment, and uh, the students were to bring something that represented their particular religion. And uh, the first little student got up in front of the class and said, My name is Benjamin, and I'm Jewish, and this is the Star of David. And the second uh, student got up and said, uh, in front of the class, and said, My name is Mary, and uh, this is, uh, I'm a Catholic, and this is the Rosary. And the third little girl got up and said, or boy, said, my name is Tommy, and I'm a Baptist, and this is a, a croissant, <laughs> and, uh, or a casserole, either one would work for Baptist. We love to eat, and um, we never preach sermons on gluttony. We leave that for skinny people, you know. But today I want to talk to you from chapter 7 about uh, some contrasts. Uh, one of the ways the Lord teaches is by contrast. Um, especially do you see that in the book of Proverbs. But the Lord did it himself. And uh, you will see, I, I, what I want to do is help you to see that there are things in this Sermon on the Mount that certainly um, illustrate uh, church members and the church itself. Now, let's keep in mind that this is not about the church. The Sermon on the Mount is not about the church in any way. Uh, it is a dispensational thing. It is Jewish, and it has to do with the kingdom of heaven and not the body of Christ. But all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And therefore, we can preach from anywhere in the Bible and uh, illustrate spiritual truths, can't we? So it's important we understand those things. And, uh, you know, I want to, when I preach, I want to try to make that clear so that you don't look at it and think that this passage is talking about the body of Christ. Because, uh, it, you know, and, and because if you do that, and you do that with all the Bible, you're really going to be messed up. You know, you're going to. You're going to have smorgasbord or goulash, as my wife used to make. I've told you my goulash story. But here it talks about two different ways, the broad way and the narrow way. It talks about two different trees, a good tree and a bad tree, which you read about this morning. It talks about two professions, the true profession and a false profession. And then in the final set here, the contrast, it talks about two different houses. And uh, what I want us to see these two houses really as an object lesson or an illustration of the two kind of church members. And uh, we're going to talk about that. And that theme really runs through this Sermon on the Mountain, really the true versus the false. And uh, that is really what the Sermon on the Mountain is about. Look at verse 20. He said, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter or wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus here is calling for a righteousness that is true. Uh, he verse, uh, verses the false religion of the scribes and the Pharisees. And uh, so first of all here, you'll see uh, two kinds of houses. And he talks about, uh, you know, people who build uh, out of different materials, and, uh, but it really didn't matter uh, what you build your house out of um, if, uh, if really it has to do with the foundation here. 
You could build your house out of brick or you could build it out of cement or you could build it out of straw or sticks. It really wouldn't matter. You kind of have the, I'm reminded of the story of the uh, three little pigs. And, um, but it really didn't matter what kind of house you build here because it is the foundation that is critical. And um, so the Lord talks about uh, these two houses and it had to do with their foundation and the difference, of course, is where they were built. Look at verse 20, uh, 24 in this uh, text. Uh, they'll have it on the screen behind me. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man that built his house on a rock. And uh, the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And that is so important. You know, it's not the building materials primarily in this context, but it's the foundation. And foundations are critical. You know, I never, uh, when we were building, I, I really didn't have much patience for foundations because I'm, in, uh, you know, uh, I'm impulsive and I just say, let's build it now and fix it later. And, uh, but the thing about a foundation is you've got to, you know, there's so much work that goes into it and uh, then you bury it. It's under the ground. Most of the time you can't see the foundation. But uh, the, uh, the integrity of the house depends on the foundation. And uh, the Lord is saying that about your life and my life. He says uh, that uh, in verse 25, that the rain descended and the flood came and the wind blew and beat upon the house and it fell not. Now you know there are some things that you have control over and some things you don't have control over. You do have control over the foundation. You do not have control over the storms. I mean, the flood is going to come and the rains are going to come and the wind is going to come and uh, the only thing you can do is prepare for them because you don't have any control over those things and it's a little foolish to spend the rest of your life trying to pick up the pieces after the storm comes. So the Lord is making it very clear that in the, as, a, as a part of the body of Christ, uh, you know, you want to you wanna build your life on that which is solid. If you look at the rest of the, house, uh, rest of the verse, he says, And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not uh, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Now, wouldn't it be foolish to go down here on the beach at Edmonds or somewhere and just get some two-by-fours and some nails and lumber and, and just lay those two befores out, you know, level off a nice piece of sand out there. Lay your two befores down as your bottom plate. Start putting up your two befores and put the top plate on it. And then you've built your walls. You put them together and you got a, a square. And then you put your siding on and then you paint it and put the windows and it all looks so pretty. But think about how foolish that would be. I mean, a fellow would have to be insane to do that. You say, because you know, first of all, a flood is coming. There's no foundation. All of the sand is going to be washed out from under it, and probably the building is going to be taken out to sea. But it's not going to stand. Now, you know, we get some pretty vicious storms around here and some winds that will sometimes 100 miles or, or more a few times, and uh, th that's not going to stand. And so uh, the difference here in these two houses actually uh, you know, had to do with uh, the way they were built on the foundation. And uh, so he's talking about our lives. Certainly you know that. He's not talking about you going out and building your house. He's illustrating it and showing the wisdom of building on a rock, something that has foundation, or building on the sand. And your life is like that. Your life depends on it. That's why as a young person, you know, you need to build a house on a solid foundation. You need to start doing that now because uh, now's the time. You are building now, whether you know it or not, depending on your, uh, independent of your age. But uh, in verse 24, he talks about building on the rock. And of course, this is a massive rock. I was watching, uh, I guess yesterday or someday, I don't remember when, I was watching this fellow who, I don't pay any pay attention to his name, 
Rick, somebody that does all these tours in Europe and everywhere. And uh, I thought, my, what a good job that guy's got. That, wouldn't that have been nice just to travel all over the world and take pictures and sell the pictures and make a living? It's kind of like Dean Wallace. <laughs> anyway, so Rick somebody, what's his name? What? Rick Steve or D? Is it? Steve. Okay, I, I believe you. Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, anyway you, you've been watching it too. And I was watching, I think it was Ireland, and when I started watching it, you know, the camera was panning, the, someone was in a helicopter, and they were panning around and taking a picture of this city, and really a, a castle built on a massive rock, just a huge, did anybody see that besides me? Help me out here. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, we're watching good stuff, and... Uh, but uh, this, I, I noticed this massive rock, and I wondered, how in the world did they do that? This thing looked like it's 200 years old. And uh, it's built and just, just a huge, huge rock. Looked like it might have been a quarter of a mile or a half a mile long. And uh, that's the kind of thing the Lord is talking about. He's not talking about throwing some gravels uh, in a hole out here and then trying to build on top of it. And uh, so that's what you... That's what you got to do with your life. You, you have to build a foundation. Uh, you know, the first, uh, the, the first psalm talks about a man who takes heed to the Word of God. He's like a tree planted. See, Paul says you're supposed to be grounded and, uh, and rooted. Grounded and rooted, like a, the roots of a tree that go down. And they, they, some of them get a hold of the rocks, and they go way down in the dirt, these roots looking for moisture and for nourishment. And when the wind comes, they stand. I remember as a boy in Arkansas, those big old oak trees, uh, I mean, they were massive. And a tornado would come through, and it did not uproot them. It literally twisted them in two. It would twist the tree in two, just like you took it and did this to it. But the roots were still in the ground. But you get in some of these areas where there's a lot of water, the root uh, system doesn't have to go down very deep, and a wind comes through and blows them over. In fact, in my backyard, remember here a few couple of winters ago, uh, they had a windstorm to come through here. We lost a lot of electricity, and uh, and uh, the, a tree that is probably probably 100 feet, maybe 125 feet tall, blew down, and the whole root system came up with it just a shallow root system. And the Lord says you cannot have that in your life. You're going to have to build down, go dig down deep, and you're going to have to build a, build a foundation. And uh, verse 25 says when you do that, that the wind, the rain will descend, and the floods will come, and the wind will blow and beat on the house, but it doesn't fall. So you can't stop the storms of life. You can't stop all of the heartache and the disappointment and the storms and everything that comes to your house. Uh, that which comes to my house comes to your house. And that which comes to the other guy's house is going to come to yours. Don't kid yourself. So the, the key is the foundation. You have to build down deep. And, and, uh, and of course, the Lord, he, he talks about it. He says, a man who listens to my saying. So really the Lord is talking about himself and his teaching. In verse 26, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, you know what the Lord is telling, telling the world? Think about, the, think about this. He is telling the world that if you build your life on my sayings, my teachings, that your house will stand. That's what he says. And he says that people who do not build their life, think of the of that statement. Now, if Jesus Christ was not who he said he was, think about that for a minute. But he said, a man or a woman who builds their life on, on my sayings, uh, verse 24, therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. So the Lord really is the foundation of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 3.11. They'll put it on the screen. 1 Corinthians 3.11. It says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Paul said, I've laid the foundation and you've built upon it in 1 Corinthians 3. So the foundation is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He's the rock that we build on. And uh, so uh, uh, you listen to the Bible, what the Bible says, you'll know more about Jesus Christ. It is the handbook of daily living. And then he talks about the house on the sandy foundation. You notice that in verse 26 when he says, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not. He's, he's like a, someone who builds upon the sand. Now, you have to hear the sayings. He that heareth these sayings. So that's why hearing is so important. Did you know the Bible says faith comes by hearing? How many of you would like to have more faith? Okay, I'll tell you how you get it. You read the Bible more and you listen to it more. Faith comes by hearing, not by wishing. Faith comes by hearing. So you need to expose yourself to the Word of God as often as you can and hear it. He said, he that heareth these sayings of mine. And, uh, and the person who does them builds on a rock, a person who, listen, who hears them but really doesn't hear them. Having ears they hear not, Jesus said. And uh, so there are people that know you're talking, but they're not hearing you. Some in this church, you're here, but you're not here. Mentally, you're not here. You're just physically here. But you've already checked out. But uh, so those, that would be those who, who hear, but don't heed. Verse 27 says, the rain comes on that house also, and the wind blows against it and beats on it. And it falls, and great was the fall. And uh, this house may be a weak Christian. Could be a weak Christian life. And uh, you know, the first house stood because it had a proper foundation. And this house fell because it had a poor foundation. So you can be a Christian and not building. And you could be, notice he says, building these sayings of mine. When you get saved, of course, Jesus is the foundation of your life. But um, that doesn't mean you're building on him. And that's why the Bible says, let every man take heed how he builds. Paul said, I've laid the foundation. But he says, you have to take heed how you build. So you can build on sand and be a saved person. And many saved people are and have built on sand. And when I, I've, I've seen enough of it that when the storm comes, the house doesn't stand doesn't stand at all. And um, so you're going to have to, you know, husbands and wives, you're going to have to build your house on, on the Lord Jesus Christ and His teachings. And young people, if you really want a solid foundation, I see people in their 40s trying to fix what they've spent 40 years messing up. Someone said we spend the first 30 years messing up our life and the next 30 trying to straighten it out. So you could avoid that. You could avoid that if you would build properly and meditate on the Word of God. There are two kinds of hearers. Look at verse 24. Whosoever hear these sayings of mine, verse 26. And uh, so he's talking about people who, who, uh, who, there are two kinds of hearers. As I said, there are those in church that hear and those in church that don't hear, even though they're, they're there and they know that a, a noise in fact, I'm probably irritate them. They can't sleep. And, um, but uh, there's two kinds. Jesus had people that heard him verbally, but they did not hear him as far as obedience is concerned. And hearing in the Bible is talking about obedience in that you respond to it. A little boy was playing next door, and his mother uh, came to the door and yelled and said, Johnny, it's time to come home. And Johnny ignored her. So about five minutes later, Mom came to the door and yelled again, Johnny, it's time to come home. The little neighbor boy said, Johnny, your mama called you. He says, I know I heard her, but I don't have to go yet. See, he heard her every time, but he knew Mom didn't mean it yet. He had learned that it, it took about three to four calls before Mom, you know, do I have to come over there? <laughs> oh, I hear you. He heard her the first time, but he didn't hear her. He heard what she said, but he didn't respond to it as he should have. And that's what he's talking about here. And uh, so there's two kinds of, you know, two kinds of lives. And 
two kinds of hearers, people who, who build, uh, who hear what Jesus says, but they don't, uh, they don't really heed what he says. And then there's those who listen and obey. Look at verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. And uh, really this is the one who hears Jesus with their heart and they are committed to him. And uh, uh, so the Lord is talking about someone who pays attention. And really as uh, you think about this Sermon on the Mount, it begins with the Beatitudes. Uh, in, uh, if you look at chapter 5, verse 6, he said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So there, there are those who hear and do hunger. They want more. They really want more. They want to hear more. They, they are eager to hear what the Bible has to say. And really their whole life is a pursuit of, of God and, uh, and God's Word. Look at verse 16 of chapter 5. Jesus said there to his disciples, he said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So uh, he's saying here that people, when they hear the word of God, they ought to do it, and that ought to glorify God. One who hears and, and does uh, what is right with others is going, going to glorify God. And then uh, Jesus also said, if you look at verse 24, uh, talk about obeying, uh, letting the light shine, and uh, having a hunger for the Word of God is also being right with other people. If you look down at verse uh, 37, he says, but let your communication be yes or yea, yea, and nay, nay, for whatsoever is more of these cometh sin. So, uh, you know, you have to be honest. You don't have to make alibis. You don't have to try to support your sayings with profanity. Usually the more a person tries to convince you, uh, they're probably embellishing the story. So he just says, let your answers be yes and no. That's what he says. Let your communication be yes and no. That's enough. You don't have to start alibying. A lot of times we feel like we, when we tell somebody something, like, you know, I can't be there. No, I will not. Then we have to fabricate a story. Rather than saying, I don't want to come, we say no, and then we spend all this time spinning a yarn as to why we can't. And so the Lord says, any more than yes or no is really a license or an open door for sin. So uh, people who hear... Uh, you know, and hear God's word, they're going to be honest, they're going to be dependable and reliable. A lot of people will tell you yes and they won't do it. They tell you no and they do it. And the Lord says, you know, you just need to be true to your word. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. And be consistent. Be truthful with what, uh, you know, with what, you, uh, what you're doing. You have, again, if you look in verse 44, the Lord says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's a national thing, of course, for Israel. But individually it's true as well. You know, people at work make fun of you as a Christian or at school. You ought to pray for them. Because if you don't, you'll start resenting them. And then you may try to get even. And when you do that, then God has to deal with you and protect them. So you pray for them. Pray for people that, uh, that make, mock you and make fun of you as a Christian. Don't worry about it. In fact, that's a good sign. It must be a good sign that maybe you're living right. One time I was going to work at Boeing. I worked up here in, where did I work? I worked at Renton and Plant Two and in Moses Lake. And I don't remember where I was, but I was coming to work one morning and I'd worked with these several guys on this airplane and they, some guys were up in the airplane standing in the doorway and I was coming in and some guy yelled, well, well, if it isn't Jesus Christ making fun of me. I said, thanks for the compliment. Why, well, sure it's a compliment. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you'll, uh, you'll get bitter or you'll become intimidated or you want to, uh, to retaliate or 
you know, get somebody on your side against them. Don't do any of that. Don't do any of that. And the Lord Jesus said, love your enemy. He loves, he loves them. He loved you while you're an enemy of his. And you were out taking his name in vain and ignoring him and breathing his air and drinking his water and eating his food and ignoring him. But he loved you, you know. He loved us, you know, and died for us while we were yet sinners. So uh, he says, uh, you know, if you listen to the word of God, then uh, you'll do good and pray for those that, uh, that speak evil of you. And uh, you're not going to get through this life without somebody mocking you, gossiping about you, or criticizing you. You're not going to get through. You're not special. You just, somebody's going to criticize you and make fun of you and mock you and all that kind of stuff because of your faith in Christ. And, and so, and that's, really that's a compliment if that's why they're doing it. In uh, verse 20, look at verse 20 in chapter 6. Jesus said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. Now, a person who builds on the sayings of the Lord Jesus Christ is one who listens and obeys. And when Jesus said these sayings of mine, he's talking about the whole Sermon on the Mount in this context, but really it would be anything the Lord would be teaching you or me, uh, depending on the dispensation or that we're in. And so, uh, you know, one who hears and does the will of God is, uh, is not just trying to accumulate possessions down here. We have to make a living. We have to feed our families. You have to pay your rent and, and those things. And, and I know those are difficult for many people because of, of, the, of the cost of living. But you know, the Lord says that, uh, first of all, you ought to start trying to lay up some treasures in heaven. And I'm not talking about sending money on ahead. I'm not talking about tithing lest you think that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living right. I'm talking about doing right. That's how you lay treasures up in heaven. There's nothing wrong. Paul makes it very clear, and the, and, the, and the Old Testament makes it clear that a man or a woman is wise if they save for the future. He talks about the ant and, the slug and, the, and, uh, and others that prepare their meat in the summer before the winter comes. So it's not a sin to save money, but it's a sin to hoard money. It's not a sin to have money, it's a sin to be greedy. You get it? You see, there's the difference. There's the difference. And if God blesses you so you can make money, and He does, some people, some people are always going to be poor. I don't care if you gave them $10,000 in a year, they'd be poor because they can't manage it. They just can't manage money. And by the way, that's not a sin if you don't know how to manage. The poor you have with you always. And the Lord had a special place for poor people. And there are people that are gifted who can make money. I'm not one of them. You know, I like for other people to make it and I spend it. But, uh, but nevertheless, there are people who are gifted to make, they, are, they have the ability, God's given it. And it really doesn't have a lot to do uh, with, with education. They may have some, but it's not totally that. There are people who are well educated, have doctor degrees, but they still can't manage and can't, they don't know how to manage and save money or how to run a business. On the other hand, there are people that have very little education. My buddy John Fortune, a roofer, had Fortune's roofing for 30 or 40 years, lives down in Arizona. That guy has made millions of dollars. Millions. I don't say he has it, but he's made it. And I think he probably went to the eighth grade. Uh, Henry Ford, I think, had an eighth grade education. They were interviewing Henry Ford one time, and, and some smart Alex wanted to, wanted to try to make fun of him. And so they asked him to spell a particular word. Well, he couldn't spell it. The guy that asked him probably couldn't spell it. Henry Ford said, why should I waste my time with that when I can push any one of eight buttons on my desk and have men in here can do it in a minute? You understand what he was saying? He said, I know how to manage men. I know how to manage people who have the ability to do those things. But it's not a sin to, to save. It's, in fact, it's foolishness. It's foolishness to not save because the storm is coming and the rains are coming 
and sickness is coming, and death is coming, and old age is coming, and all of those things, they are coming. And so the Lord says you need to build your house on his sayings, on his teachings, so that when these things come, you don't fall apart as an individual and as far as your life's concerned. So he says you need to lay up some treasures in heaven by living right. And I believe this life is a preparation for a future service uh, in eternity. I believe that. I believe in the millennial, thousand year millennial reign. I believe in heaven and, and hell. And I believe there will be a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth, just like Jesus said. Look at uh, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. In other words, if you pay attention to the Lord's teachings, you won't be worrying all the time. Worry is a sin. Really, if you'd spend the time praying that you spend worrying, you'd be liberated. Think about it. If you'd just spend the time praying that you spend worrying. You know, Jack Hile said he visited a lady one time, she said, what's wrong? And she said, well, I think I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. And so he gave her some responsibilities to do and it had to do with other people. He saw her a couple of months later, said, how are you doing on that breakdown? She said, I haven't had time to think about that. <laughs> you see, your feelings and your emotions have to do with the way you think. They have to do with what you think. How many of you think about somebody that owes you some money? Nobody, huh? Okay, well I can. Anyway, you, th you begin to think about that and the way somebody's treated you and you start feeling a certain way. And, uh, but it has to do with your thinking process. And uh, Jesus says, take no thought about your life. You know, we got guys worried about the upcoming election. You know what? I don't care. Now, I'm going to vote, but I don't care. I really don't. It's not an issue with me. I know who I'm going to vote for. I'm not happy with anybody. I'm not. But I'm not going to spend my pulpit and my time taking pot shots at political people. First of all, it's wrong. The Bible said I'm supposed to pray for them. That is what it says, isn't it? And the devil can get you sidetracked on this political thing to where you focus more on that than you do the Word of God. And some of you got, you know, the Lord love you, you know, uh, we're in a recession, we're in a recession, we're in a recession. You keep hearing that and pretty soon you'll say, I think we're in a recession. My TV just went out. You know, you got to get over that stuff. You'll turn the news off. There's nothing good on it. There really isn't. Well, look what he says in verse 25. I don't know how you can watch the news all the time and think about verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what you shall put on, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what, uh, nor yet for your body, uh, what uh, you shall put on. Is not the life more than the meat and the body than the raiment? Why, your body is more important than the, what you eat. But some people, they think, oh, no, what you eat makes you. No, therefore, I've got to eat lobster and, and steak and uh, what are those little fish eggs? I hate those things. I, I hate them. In my whole life, I've had one little teaspoon of caviar, and I said, that's enough for my life. You don't worry about it. What, what are you to make? And folks, they think, you know, they think the suit makes the man. So they spend $1,000 for a suit. You know, in 40 years, I've never had anybody to walk up and say to me, oh, you got that at pennies, huh? <laughs> never. Never. I've never had anybody in 40 years to come up and say, how much do you pay for your suit, preacher? Never. You know why? Because people don't care. You're the one that cares. Because you think the suit makes the man. And you think the food makes the man. If the food's expensive, you're important. If the suit's expensive, you're important. And you've got it messed up. See? Isn't that what he says in verse 25? He says, don't worry about it. Don't think anything about it. He's saying. Now, if you can afford it, if you can afford it, then, you know, you go to Nordstrom and wherever the big places are, I don't know. 
I don't know. I go over to Walmart. I do. I just, you know, it's all made by slave labor, you know, and it's cheap, you know. Came from China, you know. My wife and I lived at the Salvation Army store for five years while we went to Bible college. I had to wear a sports coat, a white shirt, or a, 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 a sports coat and a white shirt and a tie every day in class. I hate these things. I would not wear them, but somebody would, would associate me with Rick Warren if I didn't wear my tie. It's the only reason I wear it. I said to Jack Hiles, I'd like to get a hold of the man that invented this. He said, Brother Blue, a man didn't invent this. No man would be that cruel to his fellow man. A woman had to do that, you know, so she can lead him. You're coming with me, you know. You see this tie right here? It's pretty, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, you're saying the right things. You don't know where this tie came from. And you don't care. You don't care. I don't care. I really don't. I don't even know what color it is. I think it's blue. Is it blue? Okay, so it's nice color. In other words, the Lord is saying here that if you hear and do what I say, you're going to do these things that are listed here. And he lists them. Verse, 20, verse, uh, verse 1, chapter 7, judge not that you be not judged. If you're, going to, if you're going to listen to the Lord, you're not going to have time to be judging and condemning other people. You don't have time for that stuff. You know, you just by the grace of God, you're not being judged. And then uh, one who listens and doesn't obey is found in verse 26. It says, everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not. So really it's important to understand and uh, um, a person who doesn't do those is right the opposite. The outcome is right the opposite of everything the Lord has said. If you listen to the Lord, you won't worry. If you don't listen to the Lord, you're going to spend your time wringing your hands and worrying. Folks ask me, what are you going to do, pastor? Well, I'm going to sell my house if I can. I'm going to find a pastor for you if I can. Those are the first two things on the, on, the, on the menu. Those two things. Then what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. You worried about it? I am not worried about it. I am not worried about it. I've, been, I've, I've seen the Lord work for 50 years. He has not stopped. He has not stopped. He will not stop. So I'm not worried about it. Not a little bit. So what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't. What are you going to do when you get to where you can't walk? Riding a wheelchair. What are you going to do when you get to where you can't work at riding a wheelchair? Crawl. What are you going to do when, um, when you get beyond that? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, you think about it? Sure, I try to plan and think and look at the options. But I don't worry about it. God has taken care of me and my wife, and He still is, and He will. And God has taken care of you, and He is, and He will. So you need to build your life on the teachings of Jesus Christ. And then there are two kinds of, uh, of hearts listed here. I want to hurriedly talk about them. You'll notice that there is the sensible heart. The Lord refers to him in verse 24 as a wise person. A wise person. And uh, this person puts the proper foundation. The book of Proverbs really talks about being wise as a young person. And I'd like to challenge our young people to read the book of Proverbs through every month and get it ingrained in your heart and mind. And it will begin to change you. It will be an unconscious thing that will be taking place. And pretty soon you won't even know where these, these principles came from necessary. Why did you do that? You, don't, you say, I don't know. But it will come because of the Word of God that you built your life on, you know. And uh, the Lord Jesus makes it very clear that He came that people might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Some people just have an existence 
They just exist. That's all. They have no purpose. They don't. They haven't discovered their purpose for being here. They're not trying to find it. They're not trying to fill it. And so they exist. And that's all. And the Lord says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. He wants you to have the abundant life. A life that is filled with the joy of the Lord. And a life that is filled with peace and satisfaction from serving Him. It's the abundant life that He wants you to have. And you can have it. Of course, there's the foolish man, verse 26. That's the senseless heart. He is a foolish man. He's one that becomes stupid. And you'd have to be stupid to go down and build the kind of house on the sand that I mentioned earlier. I mean, you'd have something wrong with you. And there is something wrong with us when we don't listen to the Lord. You know, uh, I want you to look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. He says, and I will give my heart to, in other words, Solomon. He said, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit, for in much wisdom is much grief, and uh, uh, he that increaseth in knowledge increaseth in sorrow. And so Solomon was not uh, saying that learning and education and knowledge was wrong, but he was simply saying that it didn't bring contentment. And it doesn't bring contentment. Everybody gets the idea that if I can just get my education, I'll be happy. No, you won't. No, you won't. Now, go ahead and get it, but don't make this assumption that happiness is a result of that because uh, Solomon had everything, and he had all kinds of human knowledge, and, uh, you know, but it, it's not the answer. Look down in chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, verse 1 and 2. I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, and therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad and mirth. What doth it? You see, he was trying to satisfy his life, trying to fulfill his life with the things of this world. One more time, look at verse 3 uh, in the same chapter, chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes. Uh, as far as he tried liquor and alcohol and, and things of that nature. I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine. I gave myself to it. Got drunk. Acquainted my heart with wisdom and to lay hold on folly uh, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. Someone said... I drank for happiness, but became unhappy. I drank for joy, but became miserable. I drank for fellowship, but became argumentative. I drank for sophistication, but became obnoxious. I drank for friendship, but made enemies. I drank for sleep, but awakened without rest. I drank for strength, but felt weak. I drank for medical purposes, but acquired health problems. I drank for relaxation, but got the shakes. I drank for bravery, but became a coward. I drank for confidence, but became doubtful. I drank to make conversation easy, but I blurred my speech. I drank uh, freely, uh, free, uh, hev heavily, but ended uh, for to feel heavenly, but ended up feeling like hell. <laughs> yeah, that's what alcohol will do for you. Amen. That's what drugs will do for you. You know, I wish people could see the exit of sin. I wish they could see the exit. The entrance is always lots of lights and pretty decoration and pretty everything. But out in the alley at the exit, there's all kinds of garbage and rats and dirt and filth. That's the exit. That's the exit. So... Uh, this is how he felt. Look at chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, verse 4 through 9. He's, here he talks about luxury. I tried all of those things. I made me great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and orchards. I planted trees of all kinds of fruit. And I made pools of water 
to water with them withal. The wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were at Jerusalem before me. I gathered to me also silver and gold and a peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as uh, musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Well, isn't that something? And uh, I want you to look at chapter 2, verse 10. And whatsoever my eye desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was the portion of my labor. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Isn't that amazing? He said, I got it all, I had it all, I did it all, I built it all, and then I backed up and looked at it. And he said, it's just soap bubbles. That's what the word vanity means. Lighter than air. You know those little bottles you have and you put those things in there and you blow and the bubbles go? They float. They're lighter than the air. They float. But when you grab them, <laughs> they're gone. They just, everything they touch, they pop and they disappear. And listen, that's the way this life is. That's the way the things are that you're trying to acquire. It's the way it is. What's the answer? Chapter 12 and verse 1. Here it is. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, young people. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth while the evil days come not nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. I have no pleasure. So you see the Lord says there's the wise man and the foolish man. And you know how, why, who's wise and who's foolish by the way they build and where they build and upon whom they build. And so the Lord has a list of things that if you and I do them, if we're wise, we will do them. If we're, and we can expect certain results. If we're foolish, then we can expect the results. You say, Pastor Blue, has Storm ever been to the Blue House? <laughs> has a Storm ever been to the Blue House? The first year of my ministry, a storm of cancer came. The storm came. I'd been five years in college and pastored one year, and here I am with a wife and a little girl about to be born, and uh, I'm 31 years old, have colon cancer. I have to take out a foot and a half of the colon. We spend the next five years wondering if it's going to reappear, reoccur. There are storms I can't tell you about. I, I can't tell you about them because they involve other people. But uh, believe me, they're storms. We've had them. We're having a storm right now. It's called a health storm. Right? The house stands. It's going to keep standing. Because it has been built on Jesus Christ. And He's the solid rock. And He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So I don't know. Are you wise or are you foolish? Are you saved? Are you lost? Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and uh, start building your life on Him. And uh, you Christians, you are saved. You know when you've trusted the Lord. But you need to check to see how you're building. 
Are you laying a good foundation for the days ahead? Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy to us. I pray that you'll bless these uh, few words we've had this morning. Lord, I pray they'll fall in good soil and, and somebody will mean business for you. That they'll not be foolish, but they'll be wise. And then I pray for those here that are just not sure they're saved and they want to make sure they're going to heaven when they die. And I want to pray for them and I pray that you'll save them. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to pray a simple prayer with those of you who've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. And you say, Pastor Blue, I want to do that this morning. And I want to build my life on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. I'd like to have you to pre uh, repeat this prayer after me and just mean it in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. And right now, the best I know how, I'm accepting you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to come into my life and change me and help me to build upon you and your teachings. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. God help you to do that. I want you to take that card that Pastor Squires mentioned earlier. I want you to look at the back of it, and we'll be through here in just a minute. Uh, up in the upper left hand corner of that card it says my decision today and uh, if you prayed that prayer with me and you accepted Jesus as your personal savior I'd like to have you to indicate